Good to go. Good. Everybody good? All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. We will, uh, I'll be brief today, uh, but I did want to make sure we made a major decision yesterday to update uh, the community and families on the process of making that decision, and most importantly, uh, to be able to talk about moving forward and, and how we um, will be dealing with the days ahead of us, uh, which will remain challenging. So first off, once again, I want to thank all of our JCPS staff, educators, uh, school leaders, you know, everyone in this district who stepped up over the past two weeks to make sure that we could go into NTI seamlessly. Very proud of the work that I saw out there uh, happening in our schools. Um, each and every time we've had to transition to NTI over the past two years, you know, we've taken a big step forward. And so our teachers were able and our schools were able to do that pretty seamlessly, which um, I was proud of. And just to see the amount of kids participating when you walked into, you know, just walking into a classroom uh, with a teacher and seeing how many faces they had on their screen. I was proud of that work. Also want to thank our JCPS families. I know it's been challenging the past couple weeks. Uh, it's never easy to, you know, be out of school. Um, and I know that that adds stress and challenges to families. As a father of a JCPS student, I know that as well. Um, I had my daughter banging on me every single day wanting to go back to school. So I know the feeling of that. I'm thankful she wanted to go back to school, but I also know how that is as a father too. Um, and so thank you for uh, your patience with us, especially as we have to make these last minute decisions. So as you know, we've returned to in-person school today. I did want to talk a little bit about the process of making that decision. Um, you know, we get together, as I said at one of my prior press conferences, to at the, um, in the afternoon every single day, which includes Saturdays, Sundays, over the weekend, to really take a look at numbers, uh, and specifically the numbers we look at. First off, obviously, we look at the amount of staff members that uh, have tested positive. Specifically, we focus in first on the amount of teachers, classroom teachers, because that is the, the main indicator about whether we can successfully return. Secondarily, we look at support staff inside of schools. We look at administrators, and then without a doubt, those that can cover schools as well. Uh, so we look at all of those numbers. We look at them in totality. We then have our assistant superintendents and their team have discussions with each principal to discuss how many unfilled classrooms they may have, how many challenges they may have. We meet with the assistant superintendents and then talk to them about schools that may be a challenge to support and how we can do that. And so we look at that in total to see whether we can successfully go back or not. Yesterday afternoon as we met, we had seen a pretty sharp decrease in the number, um, which um, was a surprise to us, but we did see that uh, it was close to, not quite 200, but close to 200 less teachers uh, that were out with COVID than a week prior. So those 17 days that we had, did not have school total, 17 days without having students in person, uh, had a positive impact on those numbers, and we felt, look, talking to our principals, assistant superintendents, that we could return today. You know, I, once again, I will say I was proud of the NTI work, but I have to say we all know that nothing replaces that in-person learning. And our goal is to get our kids back in person um, always as soon as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so I was happy to be able to do that today, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to do that moving forward. Uh, so I think it's also important to talk about what's next. Um, first of all, with the Omicron variant that has, um, you know, uh, impacted our community, our school community, and the nation and the world so greatly over the past month. Um, you know, all indications are pointing to, talking to the experts, that we, you know, maybe have two to three more weeks of the Omicron surge. Hopefully we're peaking at this point. I'm hoping that our numbers of staff members that declined over the past week is a positive indicator. Um, but hope to see that plateau and that sharp decline that other communities um, that had Omicron first around the world have seen that decline. So we're hoping that that in fact happens in the next two to three weeks. You know, we're telling our leaders that, you know, we've got to make it through these next couple of weeks and hopefully we'll be able to return to a more normal schedule. But until that time, we're going to have to make this determination on a daily basis. 
So just like yesterday, we will be getting together this afternoon to once again look at our staffing numbers to make sure that we can come back safely and successfully. And for the next couple of week, it's, weeks, it's going to be a day-to-day -day decision. As I've said before, it's clear that what we have and are able to use statutorily, we have two NTI days remaining. We have used eight out of our allotted 10 days that the legislature has provided us. Uh, so we only have two NTI days remaining. We have 10 remote days that we can use. Um, so we will begin shifting towards looking at ways to use those remote learning days um, so that if we have certain schools or levels that have an impact more than others, um, we could say a certain level, uh, such as elementary school, would be in person, maybe middle and or high school might have to go virtual. Uh, so that's a possibility, obviously. We will continue to use NTI days over the next few weeks, the two that we have if needed, but probably use those more for weather-related events. So we would encourage families. You know, we would like to say that, we were, that we're back um, in person and we will remain that way, but I cannot say that at this time. I mean, we're going to have to look on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and the communication part of that is going to be a challenge. You know, when we are talking about remote days, and 155 schools, making sure that we communicate uh, effectively to families. Some schools will be in and some schools might be on remote learning. You know, we have to be um, very clear and communicate that well. And we will obviously you, use you all uh, and your support to make sure that we communicate that well with families too. Uh, but what I don't want to get into is a list of 155 schools and you all are scrolling 155 schools, whether they're in person or re whether they are remote. There's a lot of logistical challenges to that with such a large district. Um, and so we're gonna have to find ways to do that effectively. But if we can get certain groups of schools in person, we will do that and use remote days. Um, and then if we have to be virtual for others, we will do that as well over the next, let's hope just two to three weeks. And let's hope that there will not be as, as you know, hearing from the experts, this may be the last surge of this academic year, which would be a real positive for us. Um, and so we would encourage families, continue to be prepared on a daily basis to, to be able to have to go remote if necessary, but we're hoping at this point that it would only be a one or two day um, stay in remote and we would still have some students in person. So we would like to be able to say we're back and we won't have to use those, but uh, we will be shifting towards a more perspective of potentially using remote days as we only have those 10, uh, excuse, excuse me, two of those NTI days remaining. So uh, thank you for everybody for your patience uh, to ensure that we can have schools successfully. We're, bre we're very happy to be back in person, want to continue to do that, and I look forward to getting in school shortly so that I can talk to staff, students, and educators across the district. Happy to take any questions. After uh, speaking with state legislators yesterday saying that they're not going to look at, you know, potentially adding more remote days, adding more NTI days, does that worry you considering that, you know, you guys are going to have to, you know, continue to get together every day and sort of make this determination? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, the whole two years now has been quite a challenge. I mean, um, the decision making, um, I don't know what the right word of it, but it's been excruciating to be honest with you I mean just the decision-making process but it has not been like a day-to-day -day decision making process like it's been over the past three or four weeks I mean it is day-to-day -day where you are making extremely difficult decisions that impact a lot of lives um, and so obviously we get plenty of feedback on what that decision should be um, and so I'll be honest, I haven't slept much in the past few weeks trying to make the right decision on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not easy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, to get back to your question, obviously that does worry me. You know, the, the, the limit of the 10 NTI days, um, you know, candidly has, has been front and center for me and, and our team on the decision-making process since we returned from the second semester. Um, you know, and that, that impacts all decisions, whether that's weather related, whether that is um, COVID related, you know, the, 
those type of things, um, it's been really challenging. So, yeah, I mean, that, that has definitely been front and center and a concern for me. Dr. Polio, um, when you're looking at these 10 remote days, can you talk a little bit about the process for choosing one of those days, how it might be different than going to full NTI? Well, throughout this entire process, you know, we, you know, remote was not an option for us until last Wednesday um, because Tuesday night is when our board approved the use, the authorization and use of remote days. So, and as we were on, uh, already announced that we would be in NTI for the remainder of last week, today was really our first day that we could use remote learning days. So throughout this process, prior to us, prior to me having the authorization to use remote days, we had seen, for instance, that you know, elementary schools, for instance, had some lower amount of schools that were impacted by heavy absences. Um, so, you know, when we talk to schools and, and principals and our assistant superintendents meet with us and they, you know, we might have only had three or four elementary schools in a zone who needed support to make staffing work. And I want to say this, because we're back in does not make it that we're, we're not having staffing issues right now. I mean, we have had to scramble around central office people, resource teachers going to schools to make this work. And I know schools are still challenged to make this work. So I don't want to make it sound like today we're back to just a, a perfectly normal uh, you know, process of staffing and schools and leaders aren't having to make difficult decisions. But throughout this process, we, we could see that there's a possibility that if high school, for instance, had way too many schools that were impacted that we just couldn't support that staffing wise, but elementary school did not, uh, now we have that option on the table that we can say elementary school may be able to go in person, middle school and high school, for instance, or just high school, for instance, may be virtual. We also have seen that our high school students, the older the students, the more successful they are at virtual learning without having to have that parent sit right there with them the, the entire time. So clearly, if we have a choice, we'd love to get our elementary, our youngest kids in and have to potentially use those remote days for our older students, but it could be vice versa on that as well. We'll have to see. But oh, the data over the past few weeks has shown high school is the hardest, the number of staff, the amount of changes that kids. So for instance, if you have five uncovered subs, you know, uncovered classrooms don't have subs in a high school and you're talking seven periods a day, one planning period. So that's 30 classes that have to be covered, you know, in a high school. If it's 10 subs that we don't have in it, that's 60 classes that have to be covered. So, you know, when you're in an elementary class and, the, you know, it isn't all day, but there's not as much changing um, that, that a high school would have. So it's, it's a little bit more of a challenge as, as it gets older, but th that's the process we'll go through. Uh, two questions for you. One kind of snowballing off the logistics of things, and I know it's early and you probably haven't figured it all out, but uh, is there a chance to not necessarily, uh, when you're using, uh, potentially using those targeted remote days, instead of doing groups like high schools or elementary, is it possible like this morning, no and more both had uh, the highest amount of staff out. Is it possible just to, hey, these two schools remote today? That's a possibility, and, and we've looked at that. Um, you know, the hardest part about that is making the determination what is, what is the level at which we would say a school cannot go? And so, yes, no and more are both enormous schools. Um, I think no may be the our no, highest enrollment middle school, I believe, or at least close to it, and then more with the combination of middle and high is probably our largest school in totality. But if you get a school that, an elementary school who has 300 students, you know, four absences may be equivalent to 15 or 16 at a large school. So it's really challenging to do that. Um, what we do not want to get into is where we are publishing a list of here are the 60 schools that are out and here are the 90, you know, 90 schools that are in. Um, we think that would become very challenging for parents, families, staff um, to, to have clear. So we're really looking more from a systemic way, but that doesn't mean that option is off the table. Also, if we do that, if we said high school goes virtual, we could redirect a lot of our subs to the, to the elementaries or the middles, depending on how that goes. So 
Um, it's not off of the table, but there, there are a lot of challenges to that. Second question. Uh, my last question was just, uh, we've spoken to JCTA uh, over the you know, last couple of weeks, and you're not going to make everyone happy. It's impossible. Um, but, really? You know, <laughs> I didn't know that. But uh, you know, how much have you been in talks with JCTA when you make these decisions? Because they're still worried. I mean, there's still a lot of teachers out, and, and, and some are concerned going back in the classrooms. Well, we have five union partners, um, so you know we talk, we meet with them on a on a weekly basis, um, all five of them to talk and to um, kind of debrief and discuss, you know, whether it's new recommendations. That's that's on a regular basis, so that's even outside of COVID. So keep up good communications. But I mean, you, you know, we have a relationship with JCTA as well, and we talk, and um, you know, in the end, we have to make the decisions that we feel are right um, for students and staff based on the parameters that the legislature has given us. Um, and so, you know, that this, this is what we have. We have 10 NTI days. We've been very open and honest about using them, what we have left, what we have remaining, um, and really don't have many options outside of that. So I, I think they understand that as well. So we're trying to make the best decisions we have based on the parameters that we're given. Dr. Polio, the school board voted down uh, your recommendation to ease quarantine isolation uh, requirements at JCPS. Is that something that you still support? Is that uh, something that you're planning to tweak and bring back to the board as you all are dealing with this, you know, surge for the next two, three weeks, or however long it's it's going to be? Yeah, that was it was a difficult one for me on that recommendation. It really was, and I got to say that a lot of these recommendations have been difficult. I was not expecting that from the CDC to come so quickly um, and have shared my opinions um, on this with the United States Department of Education who is not really related to the CDC in any way, but would love to have the opportunity for superintendents, school leaders, Council of Great City Schools to have a little more uh, you know, notice that changes are coming to the school guidance and maybe what those would be and have some discussions because that came pretty quickly. Um, but Kevin, for, for me, you know, the recommendation, I've said this from the very beginning, I've stood at this podium many times, you could probably rewind the tape, and I've said we follow the guidance of the CDC and the State Health Department. So that was what I did, that was what my recommendation was based on. Um, I do understand the concern about going from 10 to 5 and some of the language of coming back to school without testing negative and being out for 10 days. So I clearly understand that, but I have to follow that guidance. But I respect the board's decision on that. I knew it was gonna be debated, um, you know, and I, at going into it, I didn't know what the decision was gonna be and I would have been fine either way with it. So, um, you know, that there are elected representatives, locally elected representatives, I believe in local control. Uh, so they had the vote to make that decision and they made that decision and we'll follow that. So, um, you know, I. I that's um, moving forward, you know, uh, I'll talk to them. We'll see how it goes. That will probably, I will not bring that back at any time during the Omicron surge, uh, but quite possibly once we get past this surge and we see really low numbers, that could be something that we bring back. Do you have another question? Okay. Anybody else? Last call. Thank Thanks guys. Have a